Well, today we have a very practical chapter in the Bible about how to deal with dysfunctional people. So if you have dysfunctional people in your life, this will be a very helpful chapter for you. I have shared uh, over the last couple of years some challenges I've had with my extended family in dealing and setting some boundaries and then also apologizing for my mistakes. Uh, I found that when somebody shares concerns with you, when you return an email rather than a conversation and mocks their concerns, that's not helpful. So I just want to, I've learned from my mistakes. Uh, you can learn from mine as well. But we are going to learn today how to set up some boundaries. And we're going to get to see that from the master strategist, Joseph. He's a master planner. He's a master strategist. But in this particular chapter, he's going to take those strategies and those skills and apply them to dealing with his lost brothers who have come back into his life. And whether you have children, whether you have colleagues, whether you have friends, or whether you are showing up to a family reunion soon, you're going to need these skills. And I, I feel like, uh, in a lot of ways, Joseph is dealing with lost boys, because these are the, the, the brothers who've been out of his life for a long time. They're a little unruly. They're challenging. They've been used to doing whatever they want. And so for him to set up some boundaries can be very key. And so for you and I, dealing with lost boys is going to require a trip to Neverland. And we're going to look at several never lessons, things that, you, that Joseph decided he's never going to do again in interacting with his brothers. And in doing so, what I'm hoping for you and I is that we're going to be able to set boundaries. We're going to learn how to be, how to be loving in those boundaries without being cruel and without being codependent. Some of us lean toward the codependent side. Uh, we end up getting enmeshed into relationships and we can't set boundaries. Others of us set boundaries, but there's no love anywhere to be seen. And in Joseph, we see this unique combination of both. So if you turn with me in your Bible, we're going to look at our first never lesson. Number one, never try to change people. Only let them face consequences. Never try to change people. Joseph knows he can't change his brothers. They have made their decision. They've been in those decisions for many years. But he does let them face some consequences. Now the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought back from Egypt. Their father said to them, well, go back, buy us a little food. But Judah, the one who sold Joseph into slavery, spoke to him saying, this man. And notice the phrase, the man. It's going to be used several times in this chapter to describe Joseph. The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send your brother with us, our brother with us, we will go down and buy, your, buy food, Dad. But if you're not going to send him, we're not going to go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Now notice, the boundary that Joseph set with his brothers was this. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to give you the food you need. But he's testing to see whether or not they're trustworthy. And his boundary is so clear that Judah can actually spell it out. Hey, he said we can come back. He said he'll give us food. He said he'll take care of us. But he wants to make sure we're trustworthy. We said we had a younger brother. He said we have to bring the younger brother. Unless we bring him, we can't go. Because he made it clear that unless we do what he said, he's not going to play this game with us. And that's twice he's able to articulate that. So Joseph says to himself, I know I can't change these folks, but I'm going to set up clear parameters to see if they're trustworthy. I want to see how they interact with the younger brother. I want to test and see whether or not I can be in a relationship with them and that they're safe people. I think for some of us, the idea of letting people face consequences is a real challenge. In fact, Henry Cloud in his book, Necessary Endings, and his new book, Never Go Back, tells stories of how to set up boundaries in ways that are healthy, especially with dysfunctional people. He tells the story of Helen. I'm sorry, Ellen. Ellen had got a brand new job, and she had moved up in the company to a point at which she was in charge of an entire division. Now, in order to move that company and that division into a new area, she's going to have to make some hard decisions. There were several people in leadership positions who just really weren't leaders. Good people, competent people, but not leaders. So she's got to move them out of those positions, and every time she got to execute her plan, she, she stalled. So Henry turned to her and said, well, why is that? She said, well, one of the practices I've had uh, as a manager over the years is I imagine my employees on the ride home. And I know that many of these folks who've been leaders for years, even though they're, they're, they've reached the lid, if I take them out of leadership position, they're going to have a very negative ride home. 
And so every time I go to institute this, I think about that negativity, and I just can't pull the trigger. To which he said, well, do you think negative is bad? She said, well, of course negative is bad. He said, well, have you ever had an infected tooth? She said, yeah. When you have an infected tooth pulled, is that bad? No. Now, it hurts, but it's not bad. He said, sometimes for the good of the organization and to move somebody forward, you've got to face the consequences and give them loving truth that maybe you've hit a lid. And so just because something hurts doesn't mean it's harmful. As she wrestled with that, she said, you're right. I don't want, I want to protect other people from any kind of pain. But often it's when we face the consequences of pain or let somebody that we know where there's an anger problem or addiction problem, we're so trying to protect them from their own decisions, we don't let them experience consequences. And so that became a major uh, turning point for her in being able to execute her plan. The second lesson we see here is, a, I think, a key one for successful people. You see that in the book of Proverbs all over the place. Wise men and wise women learn from their own mistakes. More than that, a wise person learns from other people's mistakes. So they are committed to Neverland. And here's the Never lesson. Never return to what hasn't worked. At least learn new bad lessons, right? But don't learn the same lesson. And you see that in this passage. Now remember, Israel's name used to be Jacob. And remember, he has spent his life manipulating, controlling, bossing, trying to outsmart the system. He tried to steal the blessing from his brother once when he was young. He tried to wrestle it away from his dad, which he did with his mom's help. Uh, He ended up wrestling with Laban. He's got a history of a pattern of manipulation. And the family dysfunction is on display here as he as a father is now bossing around his adult children. Why did you deal so wrongfully with me? See how he personalizes everything? As to tell the man whether you still had another brother. Whatever happened in Egypt, I don't know, but you handled it poorly. And by the way, whatever you did was against me. Why did you even tell him we had another brother that has to come now? So pushes against the boundary, pushes against the system, takes it very personally. Well, this has been a real history of his, taking things personally, controlling and manipulating. But they said, the man, there he is again, asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, Now, Joseph was not a victim of his circumstances. Now, we might look at it and say he was, but he began to say to himself, how did I get into this mess of being put into slavery? Well, I'm not going to return to that mistake again. I was naively trusting of some people who weren't trustworthy. I'm not going to learn that lesson again. So this time in dealing with my brothers, I'm going to put a whole series of questions and boundaries in place to make sure they're safe before I trust them. Now, we're going to find out he wants to love them, he wants to forgive them, he wants to reconcile with them, he's got a very tender heart toward them, but he's never going to return to what hasn't worked. He's not going to blindly trust people who've hurt him in the past. So he asked some very pointed questions, because these are professional liars, these are professional abusers, these are professional manipulators he grew up with. So he is going to come face to face with his abusers, his accusers, these dysfunctional lost boys. And ask very pointed questions. Because he too doesn't want to return to what didn't work. He said, question one, is your father still alive? Question two, have you another brother? And we told him according to these words. Could we possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? Come on, Dad. How can, we, we can't be God and know what everything's going to happen. But I love this word pointedly. I had a friend years ago... Um, person attending a church I was at and he came to me and was confessing a long-term addiction to pornography and that we had uh, had some conversations over the years when he'd come into the church and I'd asked him some questions about it and he'd said everything's fine and he wanted to admit to me that he had lied almost every time I said well you don't want to ask me to hold you accountable he said well you didn't ask the question specific enough okay he said by the way I'm here today because I hit my wife for the first time um this week. I said, wow, did she call the police? No, why would she do that? Um, Because there's consequences to doing something illegal and wrong like that. He says, well, it's it's only happened once before. I said, well, wow, you're talking about the rationalization already beginning. I said, well, how long have you been married? He said, you know, whatever it was, 15, 20 years. He said, it's only twice in our entire marriage. I went, okay, I'm going to learn this lesson. I better ask some very specific questions. 
between the first time and the last time you hit your wife, was there 15 years in between there? No. Was there 10 years in between there? No. Five. Did it happen within the last month? Yes. So you've hit your wife twice in the last month, and you're trying to rationalize that and tell me that it's okay, there should be no consequences, and you're trying to paint a better picture than yourself. I said, well, I'm going to call the police on you because you've got to face the consequences of this so you're going to be able to change. I love you. I care about you. And that became a, a turning point for a very significant change in him and in their relationship. But it required this skill. I wasn't going to return to what hadn't worked. I wasn't going to ask generic questions and assume all was good. I was going to get very pointed. Maybe you need to as well. But there's something you and I all return to. I don't know what yours is. It's probably individual to all of us. So what is your go-to returning pattern that hasn't worked in the past, but you keep returning to it? Is it the way you handle your anger? You blow up or you stuff it, stuff it, stuff it until you blow up. You keep doing it over and over, year after year, and you keep returning to it. Successful people recognize this is hurting people. This is blowing up and hurting people I care about. I've got to change the pattern. I'm never going to return to the same pattern. Maybe it's withdrawing instead of dealing with issues. Maybe it's not asking for help. Maybe it's sulking. Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's saying to yourself, well, no one cares anyway, which makes you feel alone, but you keep saying it instead of just asking for help. Maybe it's, well, no one helps around here. Maybe it's control, like Jacob. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's fear. You can't engage in a decision because fear consumes you. Maybe it's half-truths, like Joseph's brothers. Maybe it's you power up. Maybe it's self-pity. Maybe it's you have a tendency to go toward worst-case scenarios. Or maybe, and I just want to warn you, this is a real key one I've seen. The, well, I'm Job. I'm Job. I know lots of folks who have this go-to tendency. And first, let me tell you this. You're not Job. Job was the most righteous man who ever lived. So if you tell yourself you're Job, it's actually a bizarre moral superiority that you're putting yourself in a category you don't belong in. Secondly, it is a way in which you take, you get out of responsibility from changing your decisions. Well, I can't change anything anyway because I'm Job. Things just happen to Job. Things in the, in the utter uh, spiritual realm happen, and he's just sort of on the dumping ground of it. I'd really encourage you. I've never seen anyone tell themselves they're Job that's moving in a healthy direction. Maybe it's a particular temptation. Maybe it's defensiveness. Maybe it's deflection. Maybe it's excusing, blaming, or escapism. But you need to know what your pattern is. I write down mine. Every couple of months, I'll write down and go, this is the thing. I've got to learn. I don't want to return to this. I'll write it down because I never want to return to the things that haven't worked. Remember for me, um, I was a helped my son buy a car recently and I bought a car myself and so while I'm sitting in the, the, the DMV I'm thinking I do not want to pay this tax on the price of this car and the person who had signed over the title to me had not put the price in and I could feel the temptation of sort of changing the number more than that my creative mind was like there's got to be some way to justify that it wasn't really the full amount and I just couldn't imagine minute after minute and then I'm sitting in the DMV they wasted an hour and a half of my time and I'm going what if I could bill them for my hours and so if I took the amount of hours they wasted of mine, subtracted that, and I just, this, t- this temptation, the whole time I finally get up there to, uh, to write it down, and I'm just like, oh, I'm back and forth, and I'm like, I am going to write down the right number because my integrity is not worth 20 bucks or 200 bucks or 2,000 bucks. And I wrote it. Boy, it was like all the pressure was off when I did it. But I was amazed at going up to that place, the struggle, internal turmoil in me. And then the freedom that came when I said, God, I'm going to do the right thing. You did waste all my time. I read an article this week about Mohammed El Aryan, CEO of Pimcoa, a financial firm. And one of his patterns he came face to face with when he met his six-year-old daughter one day. She was tucking her into bed. And she said, honey, um, do you want to give dad a kiss? No. Why not? Because dad, you're not prioritizing me. It's like, Really? She went into her room. She brought back this handwritten note. She said, here's 22 things you've missed. The Halloween parade, my first soccer game. And she listed out 22 of them. And he said, he immediately got defensive. There's a good reason why I wasn't there or there or there. Hey, And then it struck him. The way I'm living my life, I am actually not investing in things I say are important. And he decided, and this isn't for everybody, he decided to make a radical change from that pattern. 
He actually changed jobs. He stepped down as CEO from the company right in the middle of like the, the best time. The company was doing incredibly well, and he stepped down and went into a different type of consulting business, so he had more freedom to prioritize his daughter. Radical stuff. I just know whatever yours is, it's going to take radical changes to break these patterns. Next question is, never fail to ask, what part did I play in getting here? And this is striking to me. Again, Joseph isn't a victim. He says, my naive optimism got me here. I'm going to learn from that. I'm going to ask myself, what part did I play? Judah, it's his lies that caused his dad to stay in grief for 20 years, not knowing what happened. It was his lies that caused other people to take the consequences of his decisions. For Jacob, he trusted his younger son before to his brothers, and they didn't bring him back. He's like, wow, what part did I play? This time, I'm going to ask some more questions before I send Benjamin off. But successful people never fail to ask, what part did I play in getting here? Whether it's a relational conflict, a business decision, you say, it might only be 5%, but I want to own my 5%. I want to own my 10%. Because it's so easy to deflect and point to other people's 20% or 80%. Successful people own their percentage of the problem because they ask this question. So then Judah the guy who'd sold Joseph into, into slavery, said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me. And what you're going to see is Judah, the liar, Judah, the excuser, Judah, the everybody's to blame but me, has changed right here in this passage. He says, I'm going to take responsibility. We will go, arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be the surety for him. I will protect him like I didn't last time. From my hand you will require him. If I do not bring him back to you, set him before you, then let me bear, bear the blame forever. I think what Judah has discovered is that Judah's lies have gotten people hurt in the past. And he's decided, from this point on, no more passing the buck. I will hold accountability here. Well, why has that happened? Well, if you remember back in Genesis 38... We had the Joseph story going on. He sold into slavery. And then, and now for something completely different. There's a story about Judah lying, sleeping with a prostitute. Turns out to be his daughter-in-law, Tamar. And then she's found out to be pregnant. He gets all mad and says, well, you know, we can't have this kind of thing in the family. That's embarrassing. Let's burn her. And she says, well, by the way, before you burn me, I know you'd want to know who did this. And she hands him his signet ring and his material that she had kept. And I think that chapter is in the Bible because that's the hard consequences God used in Judah's life for him to go, my lies hurt people. I have got to start taking responsibility and changing my behavior, changing the way I interact, stop the manipulation, stop the lies. And I think that's what sets up this chapter here because he has changed, clearly. He's taken responsibility. But I think Jacob's still concerned. Jacob's concerned that he didn't protect his youngest son last time. So this time he says, we want to make sure we do it right. For, for if they had lingered, this is Judah talking, surely by now we would have returned the second time. Their father Israel said to them, all right, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry them down as a present to the man. Give him a little balm, a little honey, some spices, some myrrh, some pistachio nuts and almonds. I want to make sure that we do this right. Let's not go cheap. I'm making sure we respect this man. And I want you to take back double the money in your hands. Because remember last time, they went with money, they returned with the grain, and they got their money back. Now you would think, this guy's in charge of the largest empire in the world. You think to yourself, now he's not going to remember us. Of all the people that go through Joseph's line every day, and they didn't know he recognized them. It would have been easy to justify not doing this. Not giving financially. Not giving back and restoring what happened. But he doesn't. He says, take double the money. We're going to do this right. No more manipulating. No more tricking. No, no more trying to work the system. Take back in your hand the money which was returned in your mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Even if it was, we're going to do it right. Take your brother also and arise and go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may release your other brother, Simeon still in jail, and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Remember that phrase. So the men took the present and Benjamin, and they took the double the money in their hand, and arose and went down to Egypt, and they stood before Joseph. I tell you, when you start putting your money where your mouth is, that's when you begin to see that you're prioritizing it. And for them, they decided making a gift 
giving generously, putting my money into God's priorities is so key because my heart's going to follow my treasure. I think that's why God put tithing in place for us. Because when you give, it keeps you from both overspending and from over hoarding. Some of us are savers and you can never save enough. And giving keeps you from making hoarding the idol in your life. But giving also, percentage giving to God's priorities, helps you from becoming an overspender because you say, well, I'm prioritizing other people's needs. And for Jacob, he says, I want to make sure that we are prioritizing and doing this right so God will honor the process. Which brings us to another lesson. Never let hippos drive your life. Never let hippos drive your life. You say, well, I'm not letting hippos. I've never seen a hippo. I, I've never seen a hippo driving my life. There's a place in the brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, when you have an emotional event in your life, it stores that memory emotionally. And what happens is the hippocampus, when it kicks in, emotion drives your decisions, and the rational part of your brain shrinks, actually, during those decisions for a moment because you're not engaging the rational part of your brain. So what happens, if you have something painful in your past, it gets stored in your hippocampus. And so when you come to a similar circumstance, you feel yourself react to this, oh, I know what this is like. I've been here before. I'm not going to go there again. And you think you're reacting rationally. Some people even think, well, God's speaking to me. Well, maybe he is. But maybe it's your hippocampus. And the problem is when the hippos drive your life, you're not even thinking rationally. And sometimes when we encounter circumstances in our life, we react out of pain. I have a friend of mine who says it this way. If you're getting hysterical, it's probably historical. If you're getting hysterical, overly emotion for this circumstance, it's probably historical. Your hippocampus is in charge. We've got to be careful of this. We make bad decisions when hippos drive our life. And here's what happens in this passage. His final speech, Jacob says... May God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release the other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. This phrase and this word is hardly ever used in the Bible. In fact, if you do a search in English or in the uh, Strong's Hebrew Concordance, you find the last time this word was used was way back in Genesis 27. There's something about this phrase that comes out of him as a reminder of what happened years ago. So let me tell you what here happened years ago. Jacob's mom helped him manipulate their dad Isaac to get the blessing out of him from Esau. Esau returns, finds out he's lost the blessing, and he's ready to kill Jacob. So Jacob's mom turns to him and says, Listen, why should I be bereaved? Also of you both in one day. I know I've lost Esau because he found out I helped manipulate the blessing from him. But I don't want to lose you too. So run! Run! It's worst case. Run! Find Laban's house. Hide out. Don't take responsibility. Don't forgive. Don't repent. Run! React! To which now the same word is used 20-something, years, 20-something chapters later, many, many years later, when he feels like he's losing his children for the first time. He's going to lose Benjamin, just like his wife, his mom was worried about him. And oftentimes when our hippocampus drives our life, we begin to take things that happened in the past and it drives our decisions. Sometimes those are good decisions, but many times they aren't. We react rather than repent. Other times that hippocampus leads us to fear rather than faith. Somebody calls up on a Friday and says, that's your boss. Hey, uh, we'd love to have a chat with you on Monday, first thing. Is your reaction to think, well, this is going to be a good thing? No, your whole weekend is ruined, isn't it? Fear. The hippocampus says, oh, I've been in those meetings. That's what happens right before you get fired. Oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. And that's what happens in the passage. Joseph saw Benjamin with them. He said to the steward of his house, man, take these men in my home, slaughter an animal, make it ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. Man, I can't wait to be with my brothers. They're passing the test. They brought him back. It's going to be a good time. So he turns to the steward of his house and says, hey, invite the people to my house for a personal dinner. And how do they react? Now the men were afraid. Warning, warning, Will Robinson, warning, because they were brought into Joseph's house. They said, oh, no, I know what's going to happen. I know what this is really about. It's because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time. We're brought in so that he may make a case against us. He's going to seize us to take us, and we're going to be slaves with our donkeys. 
See, many of us are worriers and worst case scenarios, and sometimes we need to test things to see if it's true. Other times, the hippocampus is clearly driving. We are being driven by fear, not by the facts. So here's what happens. Now, the good news is they repent. And what they find in Joseph's house is not pain. They find mercy. In fact, the things they find here, you're going to suddenly start to see somebody from the New Testament, somebody who says, I want to throw a banquet for you, slaughter the animals so that we can celebrate. And when they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. But we, want to, we want to be honest what happened. When it happened, when we came to the encampment, we opened our sacks and there each man's money was in the mouth of the sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hand. We have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put the money in our sacks, but we want to be just honest. That's what confession is. You come before God and say, God, let me honestly tell you, I blew it. You know what you find when you do that? Mercy. Mercy from God. Look what the steward says. He said, peace be with you. You're so fearful about confession, so fearful about what might happen, the shame of bringing it out. Peace. And do not be afraid. Now look at this phrase. Your God, not the Egyptian gods, he's talking to them about their God. Your God, make sure you know what I'm talking about, the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. These guys who manipulated, wasted seemingly 20 plus years of Joseph's life. And how does Joseph treat them? He throws them a party. He not only gives them food, he doesn't even make them pay for it. When they kind of try to return the food and the money, he doesn't take the money. He says, peace to you. And you've got to imagine that Joseph in this pluralistic society, where he's now the second command is talking about his faith in a God who works through the dungeons and through the prisons. Because he is impacting his right-hand man, the steward, who is talking not about the Egyptian gods, but about the God of Joseph. They also find grace. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and washed their feet. Man, it sounds like somebody, doesn't it? Throwing a party for a prodigal and washing their feet. He gave their donkeys feed. And they made their present ready for him. They responded to that grace by giving them a gift of a present. Thank you so much. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Joseph comes in at noon and they heard that they would eat bread there. Wow, they're having some kind of communion together. They're eating bread together after the washing of feet. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. And now we see the third thing you find in Neverland. You find sovereignty of God. Look what happens. He asked some questions. Is your father still well? Yes. The old man of whom you said, is he still alive? And they answered, your servant, your father's in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves, just as God had told Joseph would happen way back 22 years ago. You see, in Neverland, you begin to find that God can work in the best and the worst of circumstances. You begin to trust him and deepen your faith in him. More than that, you find graciousness. For Joseph turns to his brother. He lifted his eyes, saw Benjamin. His mother's son. He said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he looks at Benjamin, his brother, who he may have never seen before until this day. He says, oh, may God be gracious to you. My son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. See, he wants to reconnect. He wants to reconcile. His spirit is to forgive. All the testing he's doing is to make sure it's safe before he gives his heart away. So he runs into the other chamber and he wept there. And he washed his face and he came out and he restrained himself and said, serve the bread. So they set him a place by himself and them by themselves. So all of the, the, the Hebrews are over here, all the Egyptians are over here. Why? The Egyptians ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews because it was an abomination. They were considered unclean. And Joseph is hinting at how much, uh, well, he's just hinting, there's clues. Because he lines them up, birthright, from youngest to oldest, there according to their side of the table. And here again we see a picture of Jesus. Because what the brothers have done is an abomination. They are separated from the fellowship of the Egyptians. And so how will those who are an abomination, those who have done such evil things, be brought back into fellowship? Well, Joseph represents the God-man. Because he represents the clean culture. But he can identify with the broken culture. 
Just as Jesus himself was fully God, he was fully clean, yet he became one of us so that he could be our substitutionary atonement. He could make a way that we who are unclean or abomination could be rejoined because God is both the just and the justifier. And here we find the graciousness. And lastly, we find the testing. So he took the servings to them from before him. And Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. Why would he give the youngest brother five times more than everybody else? Because he's still testing them. He's still setting boundaries. And here's the question he's asking himself. When I give this younger brother five times more, will they be envious? I'm going to look at the look on their faces. I want to see how they react. Have they learned to rejoice with those who rejoice instead of being consumed with envy and covetousness? And here's what he finds. They were merry with him. Wow. They really have changed. They can finally rejoice with those who rejoice. So five lessons that we need in dealing with lost boys. You've got to take a trip to Neverland. And here are those lessons. And I'd like you to pick one as we leave today. Five's too many. Four's too many. So pick one that you say, this is the day I'm going to mark on the calendar. I have been trying to change somebody for a long time. And it's wearing me out. And I finally have to say, God, I'm handing them to you. I'm going to let them face the consequences of their actions. And God, I'm going to trust that you love them more than I do. And maybe today's the day that you begin to practice lesson one. Maybe today, as I, I put that list up, you said, oh, I don't want to write that down. But you know everybody else in your family wants you to write it down. What is it you're going to today ask God that you're going to never return to because it hasn't worked anyway? With your anger, with your controlling, with your sulking, with your I'm Job complex, whatever it is. How about taking responsibility? What today will be the part in a fight, in a relationship, in a conflict, you're going to say, what part did I play and God search me and show me where I need to grow? Or maybe today you realize that hippos have been driving your life. They're not only driving your life, they're stomping all over your life. You're going to say, God, I want to stop confusing my hippocampus from your spirit. I'm going to stop reacting and living out of fear, and I want to instead repent, and I want to start acting in belief that you are bigger and you are greater. And when you do that, you're going to find a God of ne- ne- the God of the Neverland. A God who says, you've been hooked by Captain Hook into doing all kinds of codependent things or unloving things or unkind things or out of control things or fearful things. But what God wants for you, what God wants for me, is for us to be able to have the loving heart of Joseph, the loving heart of Jesus, and yet in that loving heart be able to set boundaries that keep us from being powerless in our difficult circumstances and allow us to love without being codependent. How to care for our enemies just as Jesus did for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your practical wisdom from Joseph. Thank you that he showed us how to live and how to work with difficult circumstances. And God, I ask that you will make us people so secure in our identity and our, the grace that we have from you that we can care for other people, that we can love other people in radical ways, that we will be known as a church that throws parties for those who have betrayed us in the past. And yet we won't be naive or undiscerning because we will do it with wisdom. As shrewd as snakes, but as harmless as doves. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here today. 